Hello, this is the calcium magnesium force and phosphate metabolism tutorial presented by the usage of the reference chemical pathology lectures not of University of Cape Town by George Dewa and Dewa So here you're going to see the calcium and magnesium and phosphate metabolism tutorial which is going which was written by Dr. George Van de Waal. <coughs> so in this tutorial you're going to visualize um <coughs> you're going to start with the calcium metabolism. You need to know that generally calcium um, the total body calcium is made up of two thousand grams of calcium is it clear and then it is it is constituting of two thousand millimoles of calcium. So two thousand grams of calcium consists of two hundred and twenty-five thousand millimoles of calcium. <clears throat> now you need to know that what ninety-five percent of the total calcium is going to be found inside the skeleton and the remaining one percent is going to be redistributed into the intracellular and the extracellular free. Now the extracellular free is going to contain twenty two point five milli equivalent per liter of the calcium basically while the plasma is going to contain nine milli equivalent per liter millimoles per liter basically so you need to know that the total calcium <coughs> of um that's the so that the plasma contain nine above nine basically so the ranges is from eight from eight to eleven milli equivalent per liter <coughs> now in the plasma uh, in the plasma calcium you need to know that what the plasma calcium is divided into a play, play calcium which is protein bound there is 46 percent of calcium which is protein bound and it's bound to the protein albumin there is 54 percent which is that diffusible meaning that it is ionized of this 54 percent which is ionized 47 percent is free or active and then seven percent is complex with citrate or phosphate molecule. Is it clear? So we have forty-six percent in the plasma. Forty-six percent is bound to proteins such as albumin. Fifty-four percent is that is ionized. Now among those fifty-four percent, forty-seven percent is free, completely free ions inside the blood plasma, and seven percent is going to be bound slightly with the citrate molecule and then the phosphate molecule. <coughs> now we have um, the ionized complex so for the ionized complex you need to know that the seven percent which is going to be uh, with the citrate molecule the citrate complexes there's going to be 47 percent which is completely free and there's 46 percent which is albumin bound so albumin bound so all this may constitute the plasma protein which is constituting um, nine milli equivalent per liter <coughs> now you need to know that the bone the bone contains 25 milli, 25,000 millimoles of approximately all the calcium level because it's only one percent of calcium which is in the extrasolar and intrasolar free physically. So there is 500 millimoles that is that is required per day in order for you to for you to maintain the bone, the extrasolar and intrasolar free. Now you need to know that GIT 25 millimoles per day is going to be found in the diet of which 24 12 millimoles is absorbed and 6 millimoles is excreted <coughs> so 6 millimoles is secreted and 12 millimoles is going to be absorbed in the GIT generally that's that's the that's what is going to happen now for the kidney you need to know that 240 millimoles per day is filtered of which 234 millimoles is reabsorbed and 6 millimoles is going to be lost in urine generally <clears throat> now we need to know that the intracellular calcium exists in micromolar concentration is it clear so what are the function of calcium calcium can be the role of calcium is on the structure it can be helping the bone and teeth the second is neuromuscular help in control of excitation, the release of neuro neurotransmitter and the initiation of muscle contraction. Basically, all that is with calcium. Again, the next function is on signaling, where it is the intracellular second messenger. We have to know that what the calcium is always going to bind to the vesicles, at uh, the intra, uh, the presynaptic vesicles for all the vesicles to release their neurotransmitter. 
enzymatic action is known that calcium acts as a coenzyme for coagulation factor. It's also considered as coagulation factor factor um, four. <coughs> Now, the physiology of bone turnover. You need to know that the bone consists of the osteoid, a matrix of collagen on which an inorganic calcium is going to be deposited. Is it clear? So, that osteoid is just a matrix of collagen, mostly type um, 3 collagen. Is it clear? And then, inorganic calcium is going to bind to that organic osteoid to produce what is called. Um, um, <clears throat> The calcium hydroxy appetite is it clear? So calcium then PO4 all into a all OH2 general formula. <coughs> now the type 1 collagen in the bone is synthesized by you need to know that what type 1 collagen in the bone is when is synthesized by the osteoblast. Is it clear? All that type 1 collagen and type 3 collagen we had found at the level of the osteoid is inside by the osteoblast with the N and the C terminal. N terminal is the NH, NH2 portion of the protein and the C terminal is the COH termi terminal of the protein. The N and the C terminal extension that are cleaved before the collagen is assembled into the, the third into the three linear interwine polypeptide chain. Actually, the polypeptide, the peptide bonds are going to be, be, be produced in this um, collagen molecule. <clears throat> now, this is what is going to occur here. So, this is the general diagram which shows um, the formation of collagen. So, generally, you need to know that what these are the letters which shows the representation of amino acid. Now, we need to know that what at the beginning we have a pro collagen type one when the different amino acids are linked by the peptide bond. Is it clear? So we have procollagen type 1 propeptide here. We have the lysine hydroxylase uh, um, um, ascorbate and we have the procollagen type 1 propeptide here. So these are the different propeptides. They are going to, at the beginning, the osteoblast is going to produce what is called the procollagen. And the procollagen consists of all these portions. It consists of the procollagen type 1 propeptide, this portion, and the, another procollagen type 1 propeptide. Now, is the, with the action now of uh, the lysine hydroxylase enzyme, you are going to have the breakdown of that procollagen type 1 to produce now collagen, which is now this molecule here. This is how collagen resembles. And this is the N terminal of collagen. These are the different amino acids of collagen. And this is the C terminal of collagen containing the COOH. Now, the enzyme lysyl oxidase is going to act now on that collagen to produce now this is it clear this is the collagen tripeptide with the dpd cross link is it clear so you have the the cross link for the bondage here is dpd cross cross link is it clear now <clears throat> this dpd is actually di is actually deoxypyridinoline cross link is actually the deoxypyridinoline um, pyridinoline crosslink and the deoxypyridinoline crosslink is shown generally in this diagram. Is it clear? Now, if on that um, on that um, collagen tripeptide which are linked with the DPD crosslink, we need to know that what well, osteoclastic action can occur act on it to do proteolysis. And when there is proteolysis of that uh, of that DPD crosslink, you can have cross laps which are going to be produced from the which can be produced from the the, the, the the complete collagen molecule and you can have also the n terminal you can have so the cross lap is from the c terminal constituting of the c terminal you have a cross laps and from the n terminal you have the n terminal cross link um telo peptide pe peptide is it clear so when you there is any osteoclastic action it's going to break down the molecule into these two and remove the cross link and that cross link is called the deoxy pyridinoline is it clear <coughs> now that is the case here now the next is the plasma calcium so that is generally um, that is what is going to be involved here the next is going to be plasma calcium we've already said that there is 
46% is going to be bound to the proteins. It's going to be complex with citrate and phosphate molecule in 7%, and it's going to be free in 47%. Exactly. Now you need to know that albumin has 12 calcium binding sites. So one albumin molecule can bind with 12 uh, uh, um, calcium uh, molecule and hydrogen ion com um, compete for this so both calcium and hydrogen ion compete at that side of banding of the albumin and if they follows that there is there, there, that there is alkalosis free ionized active calcium will fall and in acidosis it will rise uh, are you understanding they are just trying to explain that the fact that what <clears throat> in a case where uh, um, there is there is alkalosis when the the patient has alkalosis alkalosis are treated where the the hydrogen ion is going to be hydrogen ion is going to be reduced in circulation so when hydrogen ion is going to be reduced in circulation more calcium ion can buy on that albumin site normally you know that 46 percent of calcium is supposed to be bound at the uh, at albumin is it clear but if it occurs that now more of the calcium bound to the albumin than because the the hydrogen the hydrogen ion is equation has reduced is going to increase the percentage that is going to bind to albumin and thus is going to reduce the free calcium ion so when you measure the calcium ion in this person is going to be as if the patient has low hypocalcemia but the patient does not actually have hypocalcemia it's because there is alkalosis that the patient has hypocalcemia <clears throat> The next, in the case of an acidosis, you need to know that well, there is more hydrogen ion that is going to be bounded at the level of the albumin. So it's going to displace the calcium ion. So in this case, you're going to have less percentage that is going to be bound to albumin and more is going to be free as ions. Is it clear? So generally, that's what you have to know. <clears throat> now, uh, the next point is... <clears throat> The next point, when we measure calcium, we are interested in the physiological active fraction as this determines whether the patient is hyper or hypocalcemic. Generally, we have to know that what in the measurement of calcium, actually, we need to know that what the major calcium which is important is the free or the active calcium. This is the free or active calcium here, the 47%. This is what is actually measured. And this, when it's measured, the normal range should be 8 to 11 millimoles per liter or milli equivalent per liter that's what is actual of interest is it clear now we can do now the measurement in one of the two ways we can measure the free ionized um, calcium directly with iron sensitive electrodes so either you measure directly the free ionized calcium with iron sensitive electrode this is the best way to determine the calcium status but it is technically demanding as the pH must be kept constant after drawing blood to prevent errors is it clear so in this case this is very good because when you measure free ionized um, calcium ion which by using electrode you can easily know the active ions for in blood that's very easy is it clear? that's the direct measurement of calcium ion in blood but this is technical because if there is a case that occur acidosis occur in that blood you have to take measures for acidosis not to occur in blood because if acidosis occur there is going to be more of the free um, ions calcium ions that it is going to be present in blood that, that can give you false value now the next method of measurement is correct the total serum um, calcium to standardize albumin of 40 gram per deciliter this requires a simultaneous measurement of total calcium and albumin so actually here yeah, you already know that what there is certain percentage of calcium that is going to be bound with albumin so what you do is that you measure the total serum calcium and then you correct it by knowing the value of albumin is it clear generally <clears throat> what you have to know is that the normal level of albumin should be between 40 to 45 gram per liter is it clear that's a normal level of albumin 40 to 45 gram per liter or it is still you can still be considered as 4 to 4.5 gram per deciliter <clears throat> now 
if the albumin is albumin level of blood at that time we are measuring is lesser than four gram per deciliter mm, or 40 gram per liter you need to know that one for every gram per liter of albumin there is 0 0.02 are you understanding for every gram per liter of albumin there is 0 0.02 millimole per liter of um, per millimole per liter of, of of calcium is it clear so you need to know that what when you when you 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 when the albumin level of blood is lesser than 40 gram per liter is it clear it means that there is going to be more calcium than normal is it clear so in that case the uh, the corrected calcium level so in this case since the albumin is lesser than normal it means that what the corrected calcium level of blood is going to be increased because there is less albumin for which calcium is going to bind to it so that's why there is a positive sign here so you have the calcium ion that was measured that is the total calcium ion that is measured plus 0 0.02 times 4 minus albumin level is it clear so before you see that somebody has hypocalcemia you take the, the, the calcium ion that was measured you add plus 0 0.02 times 40 minus albumin level is it clear if it comes that the albumin level is normal and the patient has a calcium level which is normal it means that this value is going to be zero and it's at the patient is actually having hypocalcemia are you understanding mm -hmm. now in another case provided that you have the albumin that is very high that is greater than 45 gram per liter in this case the albumin is going to be no this case is going to work for hypercalcemia so if somebody have a very high calcium and then it comes that the albumin is uh, it has a very high calcium and it comes that the albumin is going to be higher than normal the patient does not have actually hypercalcemia but he has normal calcium level so before you say somebody has hypercalcemia you must use the different equations <clears throat> Now, provided that it is the albumin level is greater than 45 gram per liter, the corrected calcium level is the measured total calcium level minus 0 0.02. In this case, minus y. There is a subtraction sign because here, even if I just place albumin at this place here, is it clear? You see that when you are going to put 50, if the, the provided that it is higher. You are going to put 50 minus, you are going to have a negative sign. That's why the negative sign is going to come out. So they have just used it as uh, in order to make that the formula should be get easier. Is it clear? So in this case, you do negative 0 0.02 times the albumin minus 45 gram per liters. Is it clear? Why? Because when the albumin is high, you are going to have calcium now is going to be stored more in the albumin. Is it clear? And when calcium is stored more in the albumin, it's going to reduce the free calcium ion. Is it clear? So in a patient, so it's going to reduce the free um, calcium ion. So in patient that you diagnose of hypercalcemia, is it clear? You diagnose a patient hypercalcemia and his albumin level is high. Is it clear? You see that that patient is not having actually hypercalcemia. In a patient that you have a very high calcium ion level, but you now measure the corrected calcium level, you see that what albumin is high. So that since the albumin is high, the is going to reduce that measured calcium, it's going to reduce the free ion of that measured calcium. Is it clear? So it's not actually it's, you should not directly go to say hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia without using the corrected calcium ion level. Is it clear? <clears throat> now, the next thing that you have to know is the um, the extracellular fluid calcium concentration. Is it clear? Are kept within narrow limits. So, how are they kept within now? What are the hormones which are involved with um, with with, uh, with calcium concentration? The first hormone which is involved with calcium concentration is calcium sensing receptors. Is it clear? You have calcium sensing receptors. You have power hormones, and we have 
um, vitamin D. Now, calcitonin is also from the C cells of the thyroid play a minor role in the calcium physiology. The three major hormones which play a great role are these three hormones here. Calcitonin, which are produced by the C cells of the thyroid, um, only play a minor role in this um, in this um, um, physiology and is useful as a cell the serum tumor marker for medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. So if you think of a medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, that's when you can use um, calcitonin as a um, serum marker. It is less helpful in the case of calcium metabolism. Now, calcium sensing receptor. You need to know that these receptors are found in the parathyroid gland, the kidney, the brain, and the C cells of the thyroid. Is it clear? Now, they are G protein coupled receptors, and they have particular mechanism with those G protein coupled receptors that we're going to see in biochemistry. Now, you see, you need to know that what you need to know that the combination of these two secondary messengers. That's the G, um, the second two major two major secondary messenger. The first secondary messenger is going to be phosphatidyl inositol um, diphosphate, and the second um, messenger is going to be diacyl glycerol. This are uh, um, so so phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate converted to diacyl glycerol, and we have um, inosine triphosphate. These are the two major secondary messengers that are going to be produced from the D protein couple receptors. So. These um, two secondary messengers can give rise now to the following action within the target tissue. The first action is that it's going to decrease the parathormone secretion by the parathyroid gland. And then the second is that it's going to cause the inactivation of the Ron K luminal potassium ion channel in a thick ascending limb of the renal tubules, such that um, the function of this channel facilitates the sodium chloride and water calcium absorption is it clear so those that is the role of the calcium sensing receptors so as you have said when there is high um because these calcium sensing receptors are present in the kidney the brain the c cells of the thyroid at the level of the c cells of the thyroid is going to help in the production of calcitonin which has a minor effect at the level of the kidney is going to cause simulation of the g protein couple receptors that are going to produce these two secondary messenger the phosphatidyl um, inositol diphosphate and inosine triphosphate and the inosine triphosphate and all that in the in the in the kidney what does it do in the kidney it causes um the um, the, the inactivation of the luminal potassium ion channel is it clear? And when the luminal potassium ion channel is inactivated, we have a um, an indirect activation of the sodium chloride, water, and calcium ion absorption. Is it clear? So that's why it's going to cause now the absorption of calcium immediately. Um, this calcium sensing receptors visualize that there is low calcium in blood. Calcium sensing receptors are used for low calcium in blood. Is it clear? So. <clears throat> The next is that it's also going to so is the you sorry in high calcium in blood. The next is that you have decrease is also going to cause decreased secretion of parathyroid hormone in um, parathyroid gland. So that is actually what they are going to. So calcium sensing receptors are used when there is high calcium in blood. So when there is high calcium, cells are activated to release calcitonin. Um, Parathormone is inactivated, the parathyroid gland is inactivated to produce, um, such that the, the parathyroid hormone is not released. And the kidney is activated such that there is inactivation of the luminal potassium in the ascending limb of the renal tubules, such that there is, um, there is no absorption of calcium. So it therefore follows that hypercalcemia should suppress um, parathormone par level and give rise to diuresis and hypercalcemia. Is it clear? <coughs> Now the next one is the next one is parathormone. So parathormone is an 84 amino acid polypeptide that is secreted by the parathyroid gland, and it is um, used in a case where you have a drop of ionized serum calcium. So when you have a um, drop of ionized serum calcium, what happens is that the parathormone is going to secrete and it's going to activate the parathormone receptors. Is it clear? And um, so. Parathormone activity, parathormone receptors, which have the first terminal is N terminal amino acid, but which require an amino acid of 7 to 34 N terminal that bind to the receptor. 
Now, <clears throat> the next thing is that it's going to activate now the G protein um, receptors. Is it clear? And then you are going to have a cascade where you are going to have um, a way which is mediated by calcium sensing receptors. These G protein copper receptors um, are going to synthesize. Are going to suppress the papa hormone synthesis and by the end action is that is going to result to reabsorption of calcium ion so we are going to have different action of power hormone after acting on the g protein um, sensing receptors is going to have different action on different organ at the level of the bone part hormone has a rapid release of calcium um, by stimulation of the osteoclast so when the osteoclasts are going to be stimulated, it's going to cause a release of calcium. Is it clear? <clears throat> now the next is that you have effect on it also have effect on plasma ionized calcium to increase the plasma ionized calcium. At the level of the kidney, it's going to decrease the proximal tubular phosphate reabsorption. Is it clear? By decreasing luminal sodium phosphate transporter action so sodium phosphate transporter action is not going to act and that's going to reduce now the phosphate at the level of the blood and increase urinary phosphate secretion also is going to activate the alpha 1 hydroxylase is it clear enzyme and that alpha 1 hydroxylase enzyme increases the production of 125 di uh, 125 um, vitamin d is it clear or cholic acid now this um, this 125 vitamin d now which is which was activated by the the parator by parathyroid gland can now cause an increased git calcium reabsorption it can cause an increased calcium um, renal reabsorption uh, and then it can also cause a decreased part hormone secretion so the part um, the vitamin d can cause the reduction in secretion of part hormone is it clear? That's a negative feedback mechanism. <clears throat> the next, we have decrease in hydrogen carbonate reabsorption. Um, the bottom also decrease the hydrogen carbon reabsorption. Is it clear? So the effect of, of reduction in carbon hydrogen carbon reabsorption is that it can result to metabolic acidosis. So which is which help to increase the ionized calcium. You need to know that what we have already said that the albumin albumin has can bind both to calcium and hydrogen ion. Is it clear? So if there is uh, more hydrogen ion in blood, if there is more hydrogen ion in blood, the hydrogen ions are going to displace the calcium ion at the level of the albumin. Is it clear? So what happened is that what the the part hormone also cause a decrease hydrogen carbonate reabsorption. Is it clear? So it's going to now result to a partial acidosis, which is going to increase the hydrogen ion in blood, such that the calcium can be displaced out of the albumin in order for it to become free calcium, which can be used by the body. <clears throat> now, the next is the role of cholecalciferol or vitamin D as a hormone, another hormone in um, in the case of in the case of calcium metabolism. <clears throat> now we need to know that what there is pre-vitamin D, which is formed by ultraviolet proteolysis from seven dehydroxy co um, cholesterol at the level of the skin. Is it clear? So that 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 pre-vitamin D is called cholecalciferol. Is it clear? So cholecalciferol is what is going to be produced from 7 dehydrocholesterol that's pre-vitamin D or vitamin D3. Is it clear? Now that cholecalciferol also occur naturally in the diet. So you can eat cholecalciferol in the diet, vitamin D3. It is now hydroxylated, it is 25 hydroxylated in the liver. Is it clear? and then you have one hydroxylated in the kidney so in the liver is going to become 25 hydroxylated so it's going to become 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol in the liver while in the kidney it's going to be um, alpha 1 hydroxylated that's why it's going to be uh, alpha 1 25 dehydroxy cholecalciferol and the enzyme which causes the alpha 1 hydroxy um, 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 25 cholecalciferol to be formed is the alpha 1 hydroxylase enzyme is it clear now hypercalcemia and 125 d hydro is it clear so this is going to stimulate now the inactivation so every time you have hypercalcemia 
So you need to know, and you have 125 um, um, di Both of them are going to simulate the, 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 the inactivation of the 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol because you need to know that what this is the active form. 125 di is the active form that causes what hypercalcemia. So since this active form causes hypercalcemia, both of them are going to do a negative feedback so that this producing this should not be produced again at the level of the liver. Is it clear? Now, now we are going to have at the level of the liver, we are instead going to have the formation of a 24-25 dehydroxy cholecalciferol. And 24-25 dehydroxy cholecalciferol is a storage form of vitamin D at the level of the liver. Is it clear? This 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol is the intermediate form of vitamin D. Is it clear? Why the storage form of vitamin D is 125? Um, so the storage form of vitamin D is 24-25 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. <coughs> So generally, that is what you have to note there. Now, this is the diagram showing the vitamin D metabolism. So you start with cholesterol. The cholesterol is going to become 7 hydroxy dehydrocholesterol. Is it clear? So it's going to become 7 dehydrocholesterol. Now, this is the formula. Now, on the, the action of UV light at the level of the skin is going to convert to cholecalciferol, which is also called vitamin D. But cholecalciferol can also be taken from diet. Is it clear? Now, when you take the cholecalciferol, the cholecalciferol now is going to be acted by the 25 hydroxylase enzyme. Is it clear? At the level of the liver. Is it clear? To become 25 um, hydroxy cholecalciferol. Basically, <clears throat> now this code 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol can be converted either to a storage form. The storage form of 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol um, 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 is 24 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. Is it clear? And that 24 25 chole, um, hydroxy cholecalciferol is actually um, the storage form. Now, the active form, we need to know that what also 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol can be converted to active form of vitamin D3, which is 125, uh, um, uh, 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. Is it clear? Dihydroxy cholecalciferol. And that 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol conversion is due to the enzyme alpha 1 hydroxylase in the kidney. Is it clear? By using this mechanism. <coughs> and this now have the different actions in order to be to cause the reabsorption of calcium at the level of GIT, cause the reabsorption of calcium at the level of the renal system, and cause the calcification of bone. <coughs> Now, the next one is abnormality of calcium, magnesium, and the phosphate metabolism. Is it clear? So, we have abnormality of calcium, magnesium, and phosphate metabolism. So, this is going to be seen now in the second part of our tutorial on uh, abnormality. So, say thanks for your kind attention. Please don't forget to like and subscribe for our channel, Science Geomakers. Thank you.